I am unashamed. What about you? So we're back on unashamed. I'm still in Oklahoma. Um, so I'm speaking tonight in Norman, Oklahoma, Dad, home of the Oklahoma Sooners, um, where we know some guys that played there back in the day. And um, so there's a podcast listener up here that uh, I'm going to baptize today. So I, I want to ask you, get your opinion. We've all baptized a lot of folks <clears throat> through the years, but I've never baptized somebody when I only had one working hand. I can't get my right hand wet because of this finger issue and because of the way they got it fixed up. So how would you baptize somebody with your left hand only? Yeah. You'd go ahead and get the other one wet and not worry about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Dad, Dad, I'm three weeks into my healing process here. I, I can't, I, I know it, I've but the one, who heals you, to... the one who heals you, uh, <clears throat> the time factor is nothing. That's what all this is about. We're going to read today. I make matter no time necessary. You could stretch out your hand. <laughs> yeah. We just read Mark 3. What do you say? Stretch out your hand. I probably would ask for healing. I can the, stretch it out. Uh, By the got, way, I have uh, I, Yeah. That is interesting. I, I was starting I was I started to bring up something, but I decided not to. Yeah, well, I do that all the time. <laughs> Anytime Phil says he, he was starting to bring up something, but he didn't. I'm always, when the podcast ends today, I, I do want to know what that was because I can't imagine what it was. <laughs> well, I'll Phil, tell you, and it's. Since Phil has no filter. incredibly serious. Oh. So, right. and it is modern day. And so. Well, okay. I, th I think uh, it is weird that we were talking about uh, Al right before you said that your opening we were i just referenced to jace read john three uh three five and it does say that he said to the man stretch out your hand and he stretched it out and his hand was restored so if you lose your hand for baptizing somebody in jesus i think it's i don't know al <laughs> what kind of what kind of well, faith do you have yeah. they told yeah, me y'all are, the, the y all are a big help <laughs> the government of these united states sent us a news flash you are, from now on, until we say anything's changed, you are not allowed to get within closer than six foot to a human being. So it, 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 it threw a wrench in our cogs because when you baptize somebody, you have to, get, you have to baptize them in, in, in a pool of water. So in order to baptize them, you have to get close, and it's personal, and your hands are on them. Well, I just said the one who raises the dead said baptize them. So I, I forget the government edict. You got to stay within six foot of them. I'm not going by that. Well, how about that? I'm breaking the law of the United States of America because I'm going to have to push you under the water and I got to have a hold of you without doing it. So it has to be close, up close and personal. I went with that and never caught the virus. Well, what about when your leader spits on the ground and makes a mud pie and that was what he uses to heal someone I, where are the covid restrictions on my that? power works in everything you see and everything you see this was created the metal here was created this was created coffee was created he said i i'm the creator of all matter and no time no timeline no, this is going to take a long time. That's why people say, well, the earth is millions of years old because it, can't, it couldn't have got there that quick. He's showing you by walking on water and making those fish and stuff. I can do anything like that. I, can, I, can, I made the cosmos instantaneously. No time necessary. I have this great power. So... Yeah, yeah, you're you're how uh, you're asking you're asking Phil. He's saying I'm the creator. To... Here's some fish. I'll, I'll fix them for you. He made fish. Yeah, yeah. You're asking if you're wanting a way out. You're asking the wrong man. Phil was the guy that baptized somebody with a trach, and if I remember the story correctly, he called in the cardiologist doctor, and that they wrapped correct. saran wrap around the the right. Is that is that what happened, Phil? Yeah, they put uh, that was one of them, and another he, one. He put. I saw that one happen, and it was like. It like five or six people baptized the guy, and they they put saran wrap yep. over his trachea hole. That was the doctor's advice. Yeah. 
So, so by the way, sometimes you need the grace of the grace of the Lord and a box of saran wrap. That's it. <laughs> And, and, and extra did, hands. And the doctor, yeah, I, I did think about that. And the doctor that I contacted to to come help this woman, and it was another one. We had a an elderly man who pulled up, and I walked out to the vehicle, and it was he had about eight people with him, and he's in the back seat of one of these, you know, one of them kind of like a elongated, you know, seat, multiple seats. And I opened the door. I said, "Sir, what can I do for you?" He said, I'm trying to get baptized, but nobody will do it for me. And he said, because I can't get out of my wheelchair. I said, we'll baptize you, wheelchair and all. So we go down there to the river, and we left him in his wheelchair, rolled the wheelchair down the the boat launch until he went under, and I had to have multiple guys, about six guys, to make sure. Roll it back up. If anybody slips, this thing is going out to 20 feet 20 feet of water. He, he literally was, you could, it had to have been mistake-free baptism. I think I'd have tied a rope on the wheelchair just in case. We just had six good, strong men, yeah. including the doctor again. And so when we, we just pushed the, we just baptized him sitting in the, in the uh, wheelchair. You know, that's what God said, do baptize him. He didn't say, and you know, no, and look, if they can't walk, you can't tote them down there. Well, you, yeah, you can. Yeah. So, so the answer, so the answer, Al, is you you got you have to get reinforcements. You got to get about six guys, and that way you that's you right. could have one hand. That is, I'm, you gonna gonna reiterate, Al, uh, I'm gonna reiterate, Al. I'm gonna I'm gonna make two points. I reiterate, you could you could go Ronnie Lot and just cut it off, which I think would be noble. Because it did, it would represent the opposite of what the world does of the non-believers, <laughs> what they do with their middle finger. So I think you could protest the protest in that way. You have scriptural basis for that. But if you don't want to do that, you the second point I'll make is you don't want to be known as being the man with the shriveled hand. Because, you know, all these stories in the Bible— That's what we do as humans. We tend to label people based on their problems because that's what he was known as. But Jesus said, watch this. I had two buddies that I duck hunted with, and both of them had lost this part of their thumb, Al, this part right here. It was gone at the joint. People listening, it's the the knuckle uh, to through the nail is. A wood saw. He was in the timber business. And th- those big old, you know, it doesn't take but shit, that much in your, your finger or your hand or whatever. Gone. Gone. Well, it cut it off right Gone. there. The other one, I said, what happened to your thumb? And he said, uh, turtle, big turtle. I said, how big was the turtle? And he said like this, a big old loggerhead turtle. For you listeners, Phil had the size of probably a 150-pounder. I mean, 150 that was- pound loggerhead turtle. And I said, so how did, why would you get close enough to him so he could take your fingers off? He said, I was playing with him with a stick and I was just about 10 years old. My dad was a commercial fisherman and he turned around there and he said, get away from that turtle. Well, he said, I disobeyed my dad and kept messing with that turtle. And he said, the turtle just wham and his thumb was gone. Well, he looked up at his dad and he said, you know what, what? His dad said, I told you that's what was going to happen. He just kept running the net. And uh, he lives Sounds like over you're kind of man. Phil, you have the, just a, just a small point. Phil, you have the greatest sound effects when you're telling a story. You always have had a talent for that. So yeah, was, and if, yeah, I was going to say, too, for those of y'all who don't know the Ronnie Lott reference, I had to look that up. I I forgot. I knew who Ronnie Lott was. It wasn't a quarterback for San Francisco, no, right? No, you, you just showed the lack of football knowledge you have. He was not a quarterback. <laughs> no, corner. Corner. I think he cornerback. was a safety. 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 Free, uh, well, that's pretty close. Free safety, cornerback. He was a defensive. Corner. You should have just yeah. you should have stuck with the generality. He was a defensive back. Defensive back who he injured his he injured his pinky and and he did, he wanted to, he didn't want the long recovery time so he just had the he had the pinky amputated in 1986 so I, I didn't at halftime during the Super yeah, Bowl 
Did he go back in? He goes back in, had it cut off. They taped it up and went out there. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> so I'm saying we're we have the Lord. I mean, Al, take Suck a leap of faith. Suck there. it up and go with it. You got nine more. You know what I find interesting about that <laughs> nine story? Nine and a half. You, nine you, and a half. You bring that story up. It's the those Pharisees <laughs> were were watching, saying, "Oh, we want to see if he heals on the Sabbath." It was a common theme, which which played a part in Jesus ultimately being crucified. And what I we didn't talk about when we did read that paragraph, this just hit me. But when when Jesus said, "Stand up in front of everyone," and and they uh, when Jesus asked them, "Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill?" Because we have this big controversy. And what hit me on that, I heard somebody say one time, "What religion does is." it tends, or legalism in religion, it tends to make things complex. It Because they had all these rules and books and volumes, and because we're fixed to get to that in Mark 7, too, about traditions. They make it all complex that's, on, on what you can do. Yeah, Zach has a new word for it. He got into that a little bit, eschatology. Yeah, but what Jesus did was make it simple. Make it simple. He's like... Well, let me just ask you a couple of simple questions. I mean, you think how simplistic those questions is? Do you, is it is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Well, and uh, due to pride, they wouldn't a- they wouldn't answer the most simple question, which is save life, do good. Yeah. So when you think about what he did, I and mean, you think about the Ten Commandments and the six hundred and whatever how many laws, six hundred and sixty some odd laws and the old law and combined with the thousands of rules, traditions and laws that they added, it became so complex. That's why when Jesus in the spirit of grace said, I'm going to give you two. Yeah. In every turn, he made it simple. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. You love your neighbors yourself. That'll cover it. Yep. Well, it just burnt it. And in this case, they just, they're just silent. Uh, you know, I read this morning in Acts chapter four. I uh, just it's it is funny, you know, that how the gospel expanded even beyond here. You got the 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 uh, Peter and I think John. Who was it? Peter and John got arrested. Yep, and and put in jail because they were healing people, and um, and they were upset with them, and they're like, you know, who whose name are you doing this by? And I was just thinking about the boldness of these disciples and how you know in these stories we're reading right now they're not quite there yet they're like uh what's going on here they're not really understanding all this but then you look at post resurrection you know and and the boldness that they had and um when they asked them whose name are you doing this in by what authority and they said let it be known to you and all people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazarene whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. And then he, they, they, they give an Old Testament quote. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, by which became the chief cornerstone. He became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I mean, they're, they're declaring the power of God. And it's so funny to me that, that these Pharisees, these same hard hearted Pharisees are like, you, you can't, you, can, what, you, you keep doing what you're doing, but don't do it by that name. And they're like, we're not shutting up. We cannot help yeah. but speak. They were given the a warning to shut up, but the, and they were told not to speak anymore. But they replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. You know, they didn't even slow it, didn't even slow them down. It didn't slow That's them the way down. We ought to be. How, oh, yeah. And I love how it ends in, in verse 31. It says when they when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together. Now, this is pretty incredible. Was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. 
And I think, you know, going back to our conversation from the last couple of podcasts, because what we're seeing here unfold in the gospel of Mark, we're seeing kind of this boldness begin to emerge, but it wasn't there at the beginning. I mean, you see this. I mean, you see this in yeah. the feeding of the 5,000. You see it with be, uh, the, Jesus is walking on the water. I mean, you see, and they're all like, wait, what is it? They, they're not quite getting it. And Jesus is slowly taking them down this three-year journey, oh, right. the end of which he's going to be crucified. Uh, but then that when that power comes through the resurrection, that's when the apostles get, get, that's when they get set on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit and boldness comes through that. Exactly. We need a break. So one of the things about uh, road-weary travel, uh, like Lisa and I have now, is that you miss a lot of your comforts uh, from home. And one of those comforts uh, for the two of us is our sheets, believe it or not, uh, bowl and branch sheets. Uh, They're fantastic. Uh, We've been using bowl and branch, Lisa and I have, for long before they were sponsors of this podcast. So we were excited when they came alongside uh, they use the very best 100% organic cotton threads on earth. It gets a superior softness. They get softer and better the more you use them, uh, which what else you know gets better the more you use it, but these do, uh, and we love them. So uh, check them out. They're made from the highest quality threads. There's over 25,000 rave customer reviews. Uh, they're buttery and cozy and soft and breathable. They come in nine colors. They fit all mattress sizes. You'll be able to tell the minute you sleep one night on these sheets. They give you a 30-night risk-free trial with free shipping and returns on all orders. So check these guys out. You go to bowlandbranch.com. Try these sheets that will make the fall the coziest season of the year. Get 15% off your first set of sheets and free shipping when you use the promo code Robertson at bowlandbranch.com. So that's bowlandbranch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D branch.com. Use the promo code Robertson. So what I was going to say was uh, same thing. Well, well said, Zach, because when you get to Mark 6 and verse 30, which is the feeding of the 5,000, and it's Mark has a little different take on behind the scenes. And what I propose is that we we learn that there is a problem after this because when Jesus walks on the water and Mark's account is different here also, he doesn't record Peter's involvement in that, you know, where, where Peter's like, I mean, he's like, I'm going to get, I'm going to get out of the boat. What is that saying? I'd rather be with Jesus on the, the wild seas than in the boat without him. I mean, that was, I respect Peter for that. So he doesn't record that. But when you get to to Zach's point that he just made, they had a moment here in the boat. This was the first positive sign because he's a little bit upset because when he when you skip ahead to chapter six, now this is after, and we'll read it, the walking on the water. In 51, when he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So we're going to back up and read, you know, what they didn't understand. But he's going to follow this up in chapter eight and, and go further down that road when he feeds the 4,000. And I, I wanted to propose that you see something happen in all the Gospels that I had never thought about before. But this is the time when Jesus is, the crowd start a, after the feeding of the 5,000. I think this, if you wanted a pinnacle moment where the most people were amassing to be around Jesus, because we're going to read a verse where they were actually, when they would hear him coming, they would run. Oh, there were yeah. people running up and down the hills to get to him. I mean, just imagine that scene. Because you know, when I was at the Sea of Galilee, you can see for miles. But just the fact of me visualizing people running down the banks, yeah. they're like, what is there? A marathon? Is there a race? And they're like, No, we're running toward Jesus. 
But it it all start his crowd start dwindling overwhelmed at, with amazement. Yeah, the crowd start dwindling after this because it go you know he feeds five thousand men. Which so I mean you're I'm I'm assuming there's at least fifteen twenty thousand people here if it was five thousand men. But in the in the Mark eight the next crowd it was four thousand. You said well that doesn't mean anything. But as it, if you tie this in with John the John six account, and I'll read it real quickly is af- after he feed the in John's account of him feeding the five thousand. Well, remember he gave this long speech about I'm the bread of life. Well, at the end of that, many stop following him. Uh, where's that at where it says many of the disciples from that? Yeah, that's a 666. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you, Jesus asked the 12? So you remember that that saying? And so, and I think it comes back to this, this same narrative that Jesus, although he was doing the miracles, and he's supplying all this food. Well, they had a picture that he's going to be king, and we're fixed to rout Rome. We're fixed to kill some people. And here's Jesus saying, "No, I, I'm going. I came here to die." Well, that it 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 was not fitting the narrative of which they thought. And even now, we have the main three detractors which are the pharisees the sadducees and the herodians they didn't even but, hear at all when he said you've seen all these miracles walking on water for all this bread i'm making them all the food i'm he said yeah. next on the agenda is i'm going up to jerusalem i'm gonna die and yeah. but in three days i'll be raised from the dead yeah but that they, they, they it's like they didn't like that it just yeah. went well, and even the fourth group that, that really were detractive was were his disciples. And you kind of see that when you put all this together. Now, they did have a turning point moment here in the boat, and, and, and we'll read that. But I wanted to introduce that because when you get to chapter 8, after the feeding of the 4,000, there's an there's a episode with the, the Pharisees. Now, and I just want to read this first and then we'll go back because I think it's important. And we kind of all agreed that you need to attack this from this angle. Where are you reading from? 814. <clears throat> so now look. Of just Mark? Think, yep. Mark 814. Just yep. think about this. He feeds 5,000 men and who knows how many kids and women the first time. And there's stuff left over. Two chapters later, he feeds... 4,000. So, and they have seven, you know, basketfuls left over. So this, this is really interesting. So in verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. Now, this is right after he, he, he just showed them, okay, look, I can make bread from nothing. <laughs> Seemed like you would never, and, and what's so interesting is, they bring one loaf, and I, I just kind of stopped me in my tracks. I'm like, well, why did, why did you bring one? He obviously can make it from nothing. Or did you think in your mind, oh, but he's got to have one loaf that's what they were thinking. To, to make, to multiply that? I think that's, that's what think they were that's thinking. the common sense approach to that, which is still limiting Jesus they still don't get it because he's fixed to really chastise them. But he says, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod, which goes back to Zach's original point about Mark 3. You know, they had hard hearts, which is why they didn't have compassion on the guy with the shriveled hand and why they wouldn't answer Jesus' simple question. You want to do good and save lives or do you want to follow this Sabbath? So then it says eight, uh, 16, they discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. <laughs> what? They're worried about that grub. They're worried about the loaf of bread and they didn't bring the bread. And so he said, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you, 
still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? I mean, he he asked them a series of questions that for the first time in all this that are real personal and that are real uh, insinuating about yeah. their hearts. I mean, he is not happy. And when you read some of the other uh, parallel passages, he's angry in this moment. He is lighting them up. And when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basket full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basket full of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? <laughs> so I think it's better to read this first before we read it because we don't, we're going to have two episodes where you think they're sitting there saying, oh, this, this guy is amazing. He came here to provide for us in our needs, but there's something in this that they missed. It's not what it appears to be because they yeah, obviously missed it. They, they didn't get it. I think it's easy for us sometimes to look at these accusations against the Pharisees as these people with hard hearts, as if it's those people. But here you have a comparison, same kind of language of the Pharisees and the disciples had hard hearts. And one of the, one of the, I think there's a couple things in here that I see, but one of the big, big distinguishing things that, that I think Jesus is saying here is there's a difference between creating things and creating things. And what I mean by that is this, that you go back to Genesis 1-1, and there's a word in there called, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the Hebrew word for, for create in Genesis 1-1, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's not used in, in, in other places in Scripture when it talks about creation. It, the, the word literally means, it's, it's bahra, B-A-R-A, and it means to create out of nothing. Um, the Latin is ex nihilo, to take something. There's nothing there. And then the, the God that we serve, he creates out of nothing. So when Phil, at the beginning of the podcast, he was knocking on the table talking about this was created, the coffee was created. Like We can take things, and somebody made that table that you guys are sitting at, but they made it out of something else. They made it out of a tree that was made out of a, an acorn that was made out of another tree. And it, it all goes back. Everything comes from something and we yep. can take the things that that's, that's here and we can make stuff out of them. And I think they thought with Jesus, man, if we can get this guy some loaves, he has some kind of ability where he can make more loaves out of that loaf. And Jesus is saying, <laughs> no, that, that, you, you, you don't understand how I create when I create, yeah. I do it out of nothing. And they're like, what do you mean? What does nothing mean? Exactly. I try to fathom nothing and you can't even fathom that, but there's nothing. And then God speaks and there's something. And it's Jesus like is like asking that, about, that's the, how about the cosmos. Well, what was there before the cosmos got here? Most atheists will say nothing. You say, well, how did it all get here? They said there was an explosion and that's how it got here. But, but, but instead of saying what Jesus said, he said, no, I made it. I made it. Well, I got a book. I got a. Let's see here. I got a book back here on my shelf written by a guy named Stephen Hawking. Jesus uh, was Brutus. saying, "I am the explosion." Well, well, well that's yeah. what he's. Yeah. Well, was this? That's why, I like this guy who wrote this book back here, Stephen Hawking, "Brief History of Time," and he's a brilliant. It was a brilliant physicist. Um, he's passed on now, but in in his book, uh, "Brief History of Time," he he basically says that th what you just said that he's like, man, but he but he admits. If this thing was created out of nothing, and he said, if time has a beginning, he said, it smacks of divine intervention. Yep. And he said, therefore, the goal of modern physics is to, to disprove what he termed the, the standard model of physics. But, but the point is, they're trying to get away from this because it, like, that, that's the thing. The, the, the scientists have even discovered this, that the universe began to exist out of nothing. And we're like, yeah, we, 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 I mean, the Bible said that for a long time. We, we've already known that. But, yep. but I think that's a... That's a, a tough nut to swallow, and it was for the for the disciples as well to consider the fact when Jesus is like, "Why are you bringing me love? Like, 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 like I need this. What, like, are you not seeing what's going on here?" They eventually yeah. got it. 
They got it at the resurrection, but it took a resurrection well, of Jesus' dead body to get it. They did, but I want to I want to interject something because I didn't. This didn't really. Hang on, Jace. Let's take a break. So one of the things that uh, guys first notice when they look at a picture of themselves is a receding hairline or a bald spot. I know I do. Somebody takes one from behind. I got a little bald spot coming up right in the middle. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a little bit older. This is really tough, especially for guys that are under 35 when this happens. And, you know, it's it's going to happen to some of you guys. And so we want to help you flip the odds in your favor with a, a long standing sponsor of the podcast, a company called Keeps. Uh, they realize that hair loss can be tough. Uh, that you see it in your pictures, your barber may point it out or somebody else. And a lot of people just try to cover it up with a baseball cap or, you know, do the old buzz cut. But Keeps says you can save it. If you check them out, and so we agree, uh, Keeps has a clinically proven, FDA-approved hair loss treatment. It's all online, so you don't have to go anywhere, no waiting rooms. It comes straight to your house. They've got a medical provider that's going to make sure it's right for you. And they're also, that medical provider is available 24-7 for any questions that you have. It's about half the cost uh, of a traditional pharmacy, half the cost. So check them out. That's keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash door. You're going to get 50% off your first order. Keeps.com slash door. That's keeps.com slash door. This didn't really click for me until I read John 6. Because John 6, you have the second feeding, which is the feeding of the 4,000. Then you have Jesus walking on the water, which he adds another forgotten miracle is that after Jesus got in the boat, immediately then the boat quantum leaped to the shore. And, you know, that wasn't even discussed, but I'm saying they're seeing all this thing. I mean, th this is the kind of stuff that drove, you know, Albert Einstein crazy is how do you go from point A to point B without space being filled up? It literally drove him crazy. And here I'm like, well, Jesus didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> speaking of atoms and molecules. But then there's a speech here that he gives, and I, I know we've gone over this, but in light of him saying, be careful that the yeast of the Pharisees doesn't get in you, look at the questions they asked John 6 after that boat got to shore. So in 25 of John 6, it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, when did you get here? Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because of the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Uh, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. They were missing the spiritual aspects of what he was trying to bring out. So then they, when they asked him, what must we do in verse 29? What must we do? to do the works God requires. And it's almost like Jesus in a raised voice. The work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. You're looking at him. But this is not gonna this is not gonna work in religion, in Judaism, in tradition. It in their minds, this is not working. Because they're looking at him like, okay, you can do a few tricks, you know, but so then I wanted to read one more. So they said, now, th th this to me just should have enraged him. And it, and it probably did in his anger. He didn't sin, of course. But so they asked him, well, what miraculous sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? He just fed 4,000 and 5,000. The crowds were bigger. He's doing quantum leaps. He's, uh, he's walking on water. He's healed so many people that you probably can't find a sick person within a hundred mile radius of that. I mean, it's just thrown. They're just touching their cloak and receiving that gift. He's yeah. driven out all this, the evil spirits and demons. I mean, he's basically cleaned up the earth and they're like, well, how about a sign? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in context of where this is written, it's like an infuriating question. Yep. And they're like, so watch what they do. What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. That is as rich. So they're going back to their history. Jace. And, and Moses. Listen, just a thought. Yeah. Fast forward a couple thousand years and look at the human race 
and why they don't follow Jesus. You've got the same arguments with them. Oh, it's the same arguments. So they, they go back to Moses, and look, he says, I'll tell you the truth in verse 32. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It was my father. The same father I represent, that's who gave them the bread. So look, th this is just so typical. So verse 34, sir, from now on, give us this bread. Jesus, I am the bread. <laughs> I am the bread of life. I'm taking bread and just just multiplying it by the tens of thousands of loaves to, to feed all y'all. And everybody's having well, their Give it fear. to us. He They're said, like, well, you're can, eating it. Can we have this? And so meanwhile, the disciples said, well, we have a loaf in the boat. It's like, you can't make this up. It's like a Duck Dynasty episode broke out. You know, They're like, well, do you want this loaf in the boat? Can, we, can you use that? I mean, so you see why when he when he gives that speech in Mark eight, and he starts talking about remember, you're not remembering that this is happening so fast, and they're all trying to digest it, but they're forgetting things that a human being shouldn't be forgetting. They're like, you still have to justify how he's pulling off all this power. And his message is the opposite of what you think it should be. He, he's loving everybody because they're looking at these people as not powerful. I mean, you're helping cripples and the lame and people we don't even associate with. It was and a tough crowd. It was, it was a tough crowd. So, I mean, I know that was a long speech, but I think when you look at it, John 6, where we're at here, I think this is the narrative that provoked him saying, don't have a heart like them. Yep. Man, that's good. That's so Jesus good to think about. Jesus is still a hard sell 2,000 years later. Would you agree, Zach? Yeah. He's still 100%. a hard sell. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned that John 6 when they were asking – you know what? What good was, must me? What what good must we do? Um, in Matthew nineteen, that was the same question that the rich young ruler asked Jesus. What what good must I do to obtain eternal life? And then Jesus just, I mean, decimates this guy um, in a in a very clever way. But but if you read the the whole story of the rich young ruler, which a lot of times we we think it's a slam on on wealth, it's not. I mean, he he took what that guy's thing was, but but what he says is. In there, if if you want to, if you really want eternal life, it's not. I'm paraphrasing here. It's, it's not something you obtain. You, you got to follow yeah. me. Like I, I am eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. And that that's the point he's he's getting at in John six. That's the point he's getting at in Matthew nineteen. It's the point when Jesus says again in Mark uh, Matthew four. I think it's Matthew four that man shall not li live by bread alone. Like there, there, yeah. there's he he's pointing to himself. And I, I'm so glad you brought up that John six passage because, um, you know, we participate in the in the communion every Sunday, and exactly. and and the reason why we do it every Sunday is because that is the focal point of our gathering time as the church body, and we're remembering that yes. truth because it is so easy to think that somehow we're gonna that, that there's some other bread out there that we're gonna s s feast on and somehow yep. live, and Jesus is like, no. I agree. I am exactly. the bread. Look, I'm all, I had to. I had to come. You want to take a break? Yeah, let's take another break. So one of the things we've noticed about higher interest rates is um, that's how banks are going to make more money. But it's a lot tougher on us, especially you know as they keep bumping up. You're losing money every time you need to take out a loan, and that's why one of our um, sponsors on our podcast is a group called Scoremaster. Uh, and they have uh, come up with some new science in accelerating credit scores. So basically what that does is that puts you in control of your money instead of the bank. If you had a credit score, say, of 700 and you're borrowing, you know, 500 grand to refinance your home. If you go to ScoreMaster, they could save you over 75 grand over the life of that loan just by getting that credit score up, which helps you get a lower interest rate. So they call it the ScoreMaster three week rule. If you'll give them three weeks before you have to go and finance something, you're going to be able to save money and help with these uh, definite difficult times with interest rates. So it only takes a minute. You go to scoremaster.com. Um, you're going to be able to add 60 to 100 points in about three weeks. 
And uh, that's really going to help you with your interest rate. So go to scoremaster.com slash Phil. You're going to get a special seven-day trial. Scoremaster.com slash Phil, special seven-day trial, and, and save yourself some money over the long run. Well, here's what happened, I think, to, to churches, a couple of points. One is we read Philippians 3.14, 3, 13, and 14. And somehow, because it says, forgetting what is behind, I press on. You know, he was using an illustration about running a race. And I mean, he was basically saying when you're running a race, you don't have time to, you know, to look over your shoulder and trace your steps. And somehow we think that means, oh, well, we got to forget everything. But there, there is a reminder, a chastisement of people, of his disciples in his presence seeing all the wows and miracles and learning all the teachings that you could ever imagine. And they're forgetting, they're forgetting these things. And so he gives them a chastisement of saying, no, you, there, there's a remembrance that has to occur on a daily basis. And so there are some things that we do forget, you know, as far as we don't relive our sinful behavior or whatever, but the things that led to that, and the, when our hearts got off, well, no, we remember those things because he, he started off that chastisement saying, don't be like them. And I found it fascinating that people could have hard hearts in the very presence of Jesus walking with him. This wasn't like a week. We're years into this ministry. And so and a lot of people at churches, yeah, gather up and say, well, we need the present. We're, we're, we're trying to get the presence of God, which is kind of crazy when the mystery of God lives godliness is that god is present inside of you 24 7 oh he's here and so that's why we have to remember on a daily basis what the big picture is is all about and it's more simple than complex because this was another simple statement he gave when they said well give us the list of the works that are required and he's like believe in the one whom he sent that's the work what that just that just sends the brain the religious brain into a meltdown. We can't stand it. We 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 yeah it it, it, it is shattering. That and I think about that rich young ruler because that's what he asked. He said, yeah. "What good do I have to do?" And Jesus said, "You got to follow the commandments." And I and his response because he's a he's a negotiator, right? He's like, "Which ones?" Like, what kind of question is that? Like, what which ones do I? Is, what's the bare minimum? that I have to do, which is the problem, by the way. That's the problem with our approach. When we approach Jesus in this way, the, 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 we say, what is it? What do we mean by all this? Here's the issue is we are saying, God, how can we contain you into a container so that we can still have our own autonomy? And Jesus is like, you're not understanding what I'm saying here. Your heart's hard. The yep. rich young ruler says, what, what, what commandments? Jesus says, he names like six of them. And the guy's like, oh, I've done all those, which he hadn't done all those because he had committed adultery because any man that's lusted in his heart has committed adultery. Jesus already said that on the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the whole point. Like Jesus is raising the stakes so high throughout his ministry that the only logical conclusion is to be like the, the, the beggar in Luke chapter 18, which is a story that is right after the rich young ruler in Luke's account. And you know what, you know what that, that blind beggar did? That's all he did. He just fell on his face and said, have mercy on me. Have Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. That's the response that Jesus is trying to build and say, this is how you come to me. You yep. don't come with your with your hands full of your your rags and your 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 filthy work. Like, no, no, no. You come with empty hands of faith and, and you cry out, have mercy on me. And that's when God turns and notices you. And I think yeah. that what the what's going on here is everybody wants to hang on to that autonomy. They're afraid to give it up. They want control. We all do. And exactly. That's, that's what it, that's what's at stake. It reminds me of a. Yeah, but the, a, a, go ahead. Uh. I was just going to say the biggest miss of all was they still never really understood the purpose of the Messiah. When you when you look at John six fourteen and fifteen, Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew himself. They they still had a misunderstanding of the purpose. Of why Jesus came. That's why they couldn't see him as Lord. They 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 had misunderstood the purpose of it. 
Yeah. The, the, the Messiah still, was going to set up an earthly kingdom. Yeah, and they were still limiting his identity. They weren't they weren't putting two and two that he's the son of God either. He he's a prophet. He's like the next prophet and I mean God, he waited you know for 400 years, then he sent John the Baptist, and then he sent John the Baptist's cousin, this Jesus guy, and boy, he's got some tricks now. He's not <laughs> just a prop, but that's kind of the way it was thinking. But what what made me think the Pharisees and the the Sadducees and the Herod, their response and this, you know, watching to see if he messes up and even here now the disciples not not getting it. It it reminded me of this uh this guy who says if you don't the preacher he was preaching he said if you don't think this happens today with because we're going to see this in mark 7 about following the traditions of men or making this religion complex he said do a do a google search of church discipline to take all the denominations and when you run up on the documents of church discipline and he said i want to quote one and he said this is on page 871 <laughs> And look, then he said, does it really matter what I read if I had to go 871 pages to the <laughs> church's discipline policy? <laughs> we have 871 pages? This is not like 2,000 years ago, you know, reading the, the Torah. He's like... This is now... It's a difficult is, road to get on. This is our book on church discipline and and it's consisting of 871 pages we've made this too complex yeah. so when you go back to the gospels and read these one sentence questions and one sentence lines about jesus on summing up the big picture it it just it, it does not it does not work well with modern religion it makes no sense yeah. i mean do it you you go look you'll be you'll be fascinated on what churches believe what's, what's about the, what's the text that says you diligently study the scriptures but these scriptures are talking about me but you won't come to me yeah i mean that's one thing and we have all this that we've added that you got to understand that we have to go have a rolodex yeah. and look up on yeah. on a certain situation So one of the things that uh, we all realize as we get a little bit older is that our body changes. Uh, we, I definitely uh, can attest to this. That I feel a little less like my old self. And so, you know, our body loses free testosterone, uh, the man hormone, they call it. And uh, certainly I can understand it. So uh, if you want more energy like me to counter the negative physical effects of aging, Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster with Testophen will help you turn back the clock re-energize your workouts and get you better results at the gym and help you look and feel like the man that you really want to be. Now, these guys, uh, they've been doing this a long time. It's, it's been validated in five clinical studies uh, that shows that you can boost free testosterone levels. And uh, they've been doing this for a, a very long time. Uh, they're the number one selling testosterone booster at GNC. So they can help you re-energize your life and help you get back to being the warrior that you used to be. So right now you can get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text UNASHAMED to 231-231. Text now, get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. Text UNASHAMED to 231-231. That's text UNASHAMED to 231-231. Message and data rates may apply. Terms apply. Available at Nugenics.com slash terms. I mean, I wanted to go read the text. Yeah, well, let's read the text. I mean, I, I, but I do love what Phil just mentioned. I think that, you know, before we get into the text, just to reiterate, because we've, we've quoted that verse a lot where Jesus is meeting with the Pharisees. And, you know, we, we hear the term Pharisee and we think bad. But at, the, at this, when, when this was all going down, that wasn't a derogatory term. That was a prestigious term to be called, a, to be a Pharisee would be, to be a religious leader, you were respected. You were you had the community. You were a community leader. But so when Jesus is meeting with these Pharisees who knew the scriptures very very well, and he tells them, "You study the scriptures diligently, and by them you think that you're saved. Yet you've missed me, the one that they point to." 
I, I think what, what this whole thing is getting at is the presence of Jesus supersedes even the scriptures. But what, what, what our go to is, is give us the thing. Let us put parameters around it. Let us be able to contain it. Cause if we can contain it, if we can put, put it in a container, then we could control it. And, that's the one thing that Jesus is telling us that we got to give up is our control. So, yeah, th- but let's read it. Go ahead and read it, Jace. Uh, All right. Uh, so the, you got Mark 6. So this is after, you know, what what happens with John the Baptist, and they, they recount the story. So in verse 30 of chapter 6, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So it's like they had the interlude of telling what happened to John the Baptist after he specially commissioned the 12 and gave them this power to go out and they would anoint people with oil that that's in chapter six, 12 and 13. So it's like he picks right back up where he left off there. And then in verse 31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So now here's where you see this scene of just people. They're not just gathering now. They're running from every nook and cranny. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, He had compassion on them. I love this line because they were sheep without a shepherd, just running aimlessly looking for, for their needs to be met, but, but not in a way that it was trusting in a shepherd. So, but he still had compassion, which shows his heart because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And that's what I want to highlight it doesn't go into detail about what he's teaching, but I know they're character, spiritual related issues. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So now we have the disciples dictating policy on how Jesus should run his appearance on earth from heaven, which is interesting. But he answered, will you give them something to eat? They said to him, well, that would take eight months of man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give give <laughs> it to them to eat? So now they're arguing with Jesus about how to manage money. How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. They found out, they said, we got five and two fish. Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups uh, on the green grass so that, so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Now, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and, and go on ahead of them to Bethsaida, which means fish house, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountain to pray, which is amazing and awesome when evening and i know he's praying for them there's no doubt i mean every time an example of jesus praying he's praying you know for his followers when evening came the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them so they're going into the wind paddling about the fourth watch of the night so it's right before daylight he went out to them walking on the lake He was about to intercept them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him were terrified. Immediately he said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with them, 
and the wind died down, they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened, which is why we started here. And look, what? he lambasts them when he gets in chapter 7 about what, you know, about eating certain foods and all these rules and regulations. You talked about 871 rules, and, the, and they worship, their teachings are but rules taught by men. That's just to eat. That, yeah. it, it, that's just to have a meal. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I know we're about to close here for, for, before we get to overtime, but just, just to reiterate the importance of John 6, when, when there's the same accounts in John 6, the, the thing they didn't understand is this, that it's easy to follow Jesus when he's just Savior, right? It's easy yes. if he's just feeding everybody and everybody's getting satisfied and they're getting their fill. But what Jesus goes on to say in John 6 is he, he redefines what the real bread of life is. He says, yeah. I'm the bread of life. And, and, and when we partake that, just to reiterate again, the Lord's Supper every Sunday, we're proclaiming what? His death. We're proclaiming his death but, until he returns. And so that's the part that I think that, that's the that's the lordship part, the part about dying to yourself and the pain and like, whoa, 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 hold on. I, I, I'm in this because you're supposed to be the conquering savior. And he's like, yeah, but I'm also the crucified Lord. And you and you, if, if you don't if you don't see Jesus as both Lord and savior, then you don't see Jesus at all. Because well, that's, that's not true. who he is. He's and both. I'll, I want to say in closing, we can talk about this in overtime, is that, look, uh, I think Matthew's account says that in this moment of, of the walking on the water, they their response was to worship him. And I do think it was a turning moment. But, here, but two chapters later in Mark, <laughs> he's then hammering them with questions again. Don't you understand? And don't you remember? And I think it goes back to their forget. They're having these moments where they're like, oh, Oh, and then they forget it the next day because there's chaos going on. And so it reminds me of us. Look, this is a daily walk of remembering the big picture and who Jesus is and our role in the kingdom. Yep. See you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.